wow, es impresionante estar en una sala con personas después de un año a través de llamadas en Zoom. Es casi irrealista verlos a todos ustedes aquí en persona. Wonderfully familiar. And so perfect that it is our industry, hospitality, that is embracing sort of this new world and meeting in person. It's fabulous to be in Cancun, the Moon Palace Resorts. What a wonderful place for us to be convening. And I have to say that um, this is my first international trip since January 2020. How many of you are making your first international trip here to Cancun? Clap if this is your first international trip since the pandemic hit. I have to say I felt a little bit rusty. You know, I, I had to go find my passport, look for it in the drawer, because I hadn't pulled it out in more than a year. And then all the new technology, you know, uploading COVID test results, signing up for things in, with technology that we'd never used before, all the safety protocols, and then arriving at airports where they are so much busier than they were six months ago, even three months ago. And it all felt good. It really felt good. And it felt like we are ready to move on. So here at the conference, I have to say, this is such an important part of what we are doing here. It's really to show that we can travel and we can travel safely and we can bring people back to work. What a pleasure it is here at the Moon Palace Resorts to see so many people employed and busy and back to work and doing such a wonderful job, not only with the safety protocols, but also to have the warm hospitality that is really the signature of our industry and our sector. So we want to applaud the WTTC, all of your leadership for really showing that we can meet, that we can do it safely, and we can be supportive of the kind of hygiene protocols that will make everybody comfortable to get back on the road again. I think we really can live up to what the promise of this conference is, which is to unite the world for recovery, our conference theme. So as we move on here, uh, before we kick off our opening panel, I just want to say on a personal note, I've been in this industry for 15 years. Bill Marriott from Marriott International brought me into the industry, and my boss became Arnie Sorensen. Thank you so much for honoring Arnie today, Chris. Um, I could just see him on this stage. Also, he was so much about the values that you're going to be talking about at this conference. First of all, making the business healthy again. Number two, putting people first and doing it in a way that is inclusive, that supports diversity, and also is sustainable. So thank you for, for doing that. I feel very much my role as an ambassador at WTTC is a legacy of Arnie Sorensen. So some housekeeping before we bring all of you up on the stage over the next several hours and the next two days, because you are the experts. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your personal experiences and the strategies that you're using to move us forward. So the first thing is, if you haven't downloaded the WTTC app, I urge you to do that now. The app will be your portal to be able to use this conference to maximum benefit. So you just go to the WTTC in the App Store, bring up WTTC, and then the app uh, um, uh, password is Cancun 2021. Through that app, you'll be able to participate. You'll be able to ask questions. It's very easy to do. All you have to do is open up the schedule for the program, uh, click on the relevant panel section, and you'll see submit a question, and then you'll be able to press submit, and those of us up here on the stage moderating the panels will be able to integrate your ideas, your input, and your questions into it. Let's also talk a little bit about the safety protocols. I think we can't remind ourselves enough. It's very easy to get out of the habit of uh, maintaining those protocols. So first of all, this hotel, this property, Moon Palace Resorts, has done an amazing job. At every touch point, you have hand sanitizer you can use, and the staff is encouraging you to do that. The seating here is all socially distanced, and at the social events it will be. But when we get out in the hallways, please respect the social distancing. 
wear your mask at all times. Those of us on stage are socially distanced. We're not wearing our mask, but when we go down into the audience, we will be. We remind you, keep your masks on. It's so important in this room and throughout the venue. Regularly wash your hands again when you go um, uh, to your hotel room as you transition from all of the various parts of the conference. So I think we're ready now to welcome our virtual audience. You too can participate. You can ask questions uh, of the panelists here. And beyond the 600 people in this room, we anticipate there will be thousands of people that will be joining us virtually. For all of you, the important thing to know is that you can actually access all the content of this conference, uh, not only over these two days, but beyond. We have a WTTC virtual platform. Uh, the content is also accessible on YouTube and eTurbo News. Uh, and all of the sessions can be streamed or will be streamed to the WTTC virtual platform. You can catch up later with video on demand. Uh, we also have all these sessions in multiple languages, not only English, but Spanish, Mandarin, and Japanese. And the platform will be available for one month after the summit for all of you here in the room. We even have some simultaneous content going on, and we'll tell you more about that later. So it's my pleasure to be able to uh, kick off with the very first panel. Uh, it focuses on the big picture, the impact of COVID-19 on travel and tourism, the lessons that we've already learned globally and regionally, uh, not just the impact on our economy, on our sector financially, but on the people employed by travel and tourism. Because really, we have to remember, this has been an economic crisis, 17 times greater than the last financial crisis we went through. It's been a health crisis, but ultimately, it has been a human crisis. So the first panel is entitled COVID-19 from start to present. It'll bring together a diverse and wonderful cast of speakers to consider how far we've come since January of 2020, uh, what we've learned since the pandemic hit, the, um, how we can accelerate the recovery of the uh, sector. And so I would love to bring our panelists up to the stage right now. Let me welcome them. We have Arnold Donald, who is the president and chief executive officer of Carnival Co Corporation and our incoming chairman of uh, WTTC. Great to have you on the panel. Greg O'Hara, who's the founder and managing partner of Sertaris. We have Rita Marquez, the Secretary of State of Tourism of Portugal. We have Jose Reynosos de Val, the Executive Vice President and Chief Revenue Officer of Telmex. And we have Matthew Upchurch, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Virtuosa. Thank you, and please give them a round of applause as they join us up here today. Um, we want to hear your stories. This is very much what we're doing at this summit. We're catching up. We're hearing from each other face to face what this past year has been like. Uh, and so I'd love to start with you, um, uh, Matthew, if you wouldn't mind. Um, um, I mean, um, Arnold, with Arnold, um, uh, because you are our incoming chairman, but also because your industry, cruise lines, in so many ways felt like the tip of the spear into the heart of travel and tourism. When we heard of some of those first stories anecdotally of people emerging from Asia and other places, coming, getting sick, having the virus, cruise ships being quarantined. Tell us in the past year, what was the lowest moment for you, but also where you feel you are today as we sort of emerge from this cocoon that we've been living in. Yeah, well, thank you, Kathleen, and good morning, everybody. Um, you know, our highest responsibility and our top priorities always, always are compliance, environmental protection, and the health, safety, and well-being of our guests, of the people in the communities that we touch and serve, and then our Carnival family, and that's um, our shoreside and shipboard personnel. So that's job one. So the first, the lowest point, is all of those people being negatively impacted, you know, by the virus. Now, when it first happened, you say the tip of the spear, you know, the, the reality is the world didn't understand, nobody knew. So whatever is on land, if it moves around, it gets to wherever it's going. And so we ended up with, from community spread, people on ships. Uh, and then we had a couple of situations um, that with quarantines that were run by 
health uh, ministries, um, not, not by us. But in any event, you know, that, that's the lowest point is the, the impact on everyone, and not just our people, but the guests, all of our partners, all the small businesses and individuals that are dependent on the cruise industry um, for their livelihood. Um, so that's the low point, and then those that actually, obviously, uh, suffered um, health uh, results uh, from the virus. On the other hand, um, what was phenomenal and encouraging was the human spirit. So the guests, their outpouring of um, love and affection and support for our crew and our shoreside personnel, um, all of our partners. We had to pause operations. Uh, we have been paused since March. So we've had zero revenue since March um, with a burn rate that continues because we have to keep the ship sailing. You can't park a ship. If you park the ship, you have to scrap it. Um, you know, mold the set and everything else set up. So you have to keep operating the ships with no guests and no revenue. Uh, so, um, so the human spirit of all those that support and then the human spirit of our people. We had to repatriate 90,000 crew members home when the borders were closed, no airlines were flying, et cetera. We had to, uh, in a period of months, um, repatriate 250,000 guests home. Uh, and so that's been the most remarkable thing. Uh, and the future is very bright. We all know that. And we are now sailing again in Germany and Italy and a few other places. Six of our nine brands will be sailing in June and July, a few ships at a time, but it's a start. And uh, we continue to work on things in the U.S. as well to be able to service the Caribbean. That's great. Rita, let me ask you as a country, sort of what was the lowest moment in the past year for you and where do you see yourself um, on this transition to sort of a brighter future? You know, as a government, um, in the government side, we are always very attentive to the deaths, so the numbers. And, and so sometimes we wanted to open up and, and push for the, the industry, for the sector. But, um, you know, the numbers were uh, alerting us that it was not the right timing. And, and so this was our first priority to, to keep uh, all society alive, all, you know, to, to fight against the virus, uh, taking into account the resources, the limited resources we did have, we do have in the national health systems because it's, it's, it's never enough, you know. No matter how much resource you have, they, they, are, they are not going to be enough to fight this virus. So I think this was the worst, the, the, the toughest part of the equation. About the future, well, I'm optimistic as well. The problem is that we know that the future is going to be bright. Uh, we just don't know when it's going to, to happen. Um, because, you know, uh, I remember last year in March uh, 2020, when we first met, we put together a crisis cabinet, and we were discussing how to save Easter 2020. And, and so this pandemic has been very strong, it's true. But you know the timing is also it's very very long. Uh, it's, it's 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 and it's keeping us you know in this expectation to know when are we starting. We see some sight, some light in the, the the end of the tunnel, but we still have to you know um, step by step um, trying to get there. And um, it's never the, the the right timing to get there. <laughs> Matthew, let me ask you. Um, was there a moment where you said, oh, I didn't think it could get worse, and it did? Well, it's actually, it's actually very hard to pick a particular low moment because it's like riding a roller coaster you can't get off of. Um, so I think one of the things it's been is just the continuous process of dealing with uncertainty and getting to the next level. I will say that one of the things that I, that people that are not in our industry, I remember in, in uh, April after the 30% drop in March, people outside the industry said, I asked them, how much lower do you think we went in April? And people said, well, I'm another 40, you know, 30, 40%. I said, try 130. And people that are not in this industry said, how can you be less than 100%? It's called refunds. And it means you had to actually work as hard to repatriate, to take care of the clients during that, that, that piece of it. So that was, those, those are the low moments. And then of course, we had a, a several peaks, the adrenaline of, of taking care of the clients at the beginning of it, then the economic realities, and thank goodness, as WTTC has acknowledged, uh, a number of schemes around the world did actually acknowledge the, 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 the plight 
of large sectors of our industry, and that helped, but we didn't know when and how, and, and it varies around the world. Um, and now what's interesting is, you know, the high point has been that every disruption for the global travel advisors and our partners has actually helped our profession. Um, and I think the one good thing is the, the outpouring of care from our clients, the connection with our partners and the way we collaborated, the spirit of collaboration amongst our network was a, was a high point, better than ever. And I think what Gloria said was, was absolutely important, which is I've never seen the government and private sector worked as well. Advocacy became a huge part of it. Um, but I will tell you right now, as we speak, it definitely is feast or famine right now. Because in every single place where people can travel, literally they can't keep up with demand. So nothing changes human behavior like taking something away that you took for granted. And you know, this whole thing about connection, my favorite line has always been because ultimately you can't take the human out of humanity. That's right. Jose, tell us uh, your experience. What, you know, the lowest moment, if you can remember that, and sort of where you see yourself at this point in terms of your optimism. I think that in the telecom and IT industry, there has not been a, a lowest point. We have been working harder than ever. Uh, in America Mobile, we serve 24 countries. In Europe, Latin America, we serve from Kiev or Austria, Vienna, to Punta del Este, Los Cabos, Cancun. And uh, I think that we are proud to serve most of the markets uh, in the industry in Latin America. Uh, and uh, it has been a tremendous time because we have been uh, working with the industry, trying to find ways to serve better with omnichannel solutions that needed to be play on placed on time very fast. Uh, we also need to um, convey with the industry in trying to um, keep up the technology while having this um, slowdown in the economy. And also we had to, to work very hard with the small and medium businesses, the, the, this uh, service industry that needed to apply online services very fast in order to change the brick and mortar to an online life. So it has been a very exciting time and uh, we are looking forward very much on what is happening because technology is defining the new uh, industry, definitely. Right, and now Greg, um, you know, from an investment standpoint, you hear of telecom doing very well through this crisis um, because we all moved to Zoom and other ways to communicate. Uh, we needed to stay together, so you did that virtually, but you had an industry that was so damaged. What was, what was, what were sort of the epiphany moments for you and a sense of could it get worse than this and sort of where you see us right now? I, I don't know if they've all occurred yet. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in, I would say the, the, the low point for, as Arnold said, and I think, I think uh, Matthew said, we didn't think this was going to last very long initially. Um, we'd seen SARS and we'd seen other viral infections and they had lasted a series of a few months. Um, this is the only period that I can think of where the travel industry hasn't rebounded entirely inside of six months after a, after a crisis. So I'd say there was a, there was a, there was a, the first few months was this is going to dissipate, this is going to dissipate. And the low point for us, I would say, was, um, was realizing that this was not going to dissipate. We were going to be in this for a, a long time. And then the two things, if, since you based it on financials, I think there were companies out there, uh, like Carnival and, and others, who acted quickly to get liquidity that, that they required. Uh, it gave people confidence in their brand. It gave their employees confidence in the return. Um, it wasn't easy, I'm sure, for, for any of us who had to go get liquidity right away uh, to do that. But we, we, um, uh, we were able to establish the companies that we'd already invested in with adequate liquidity to last through what we thought would be a protracted crisis. We all refer to this thing called travel. and. It's really not a homogenous industry. It's a heterogeneous industry, and different things will come back in different orders. So different businesses required different amounts of money. That said, it was also a tremendous opportunity for us because we were sitting on vast amounts of capital, and businesses required that capital. So whether it was TripAdvisor or G Adventures or Getaway or whatever it is, we were able to 
uh, inject capital into those businesses quickly because we had been monitoring them beforehand. Um, but I still think you'll see some things. To, you'll, you'll see some things to come. Path to recovery won't be smooth. It'll be bumpy for a lot of us. And uh, as Chris said earlier on, it's going to require our time and attention to be able to help our all of our stakeholders to recover in a in a in a way that um, that we can all hold our he uh, heads high. Not just our clients, our uh, not just the small businesses that that rely on us, um, our our employees, our investors, our our capital partners, all those people. Uh, are looking forward to our recovery. It's a it's a big industry. It's the biggest one in the world. So uh, we all have a, a a tall order in front of us. Great. I want to do one lightning round with all of you, and then we're going to start taking some questions that are already coming in on the app. Um, so just Matthew, why don't we just start with you and go right across the panel? Um, what are the barriers that you see right now, still, either on an international, national, or regional basis, that are an impediment to recovery? Things that you would like to see mm -hmm. change, lifted. Mm -hmm adapted. Were well, you going to like me as a moderator because I thought about it this morning. Just read the page and a half that WTTC put out. Risk assessment, right? Uh, the protocols, the safety. I mean, it's right there. I mean, it, it's, it's very well done. If you haven't read it, read it. Um, and I do think that as governments and places are figuring out, you know, the ability to act on those things. And I do think that some of those policies, not having the idea of focusing on the risk of the individual traveler, you know, huge news yesterday with the EU. I mean, that was a big move forward. So I think the risk assessment piece, the testing, the protocols of safety, it's right there. So I, that, read that document. <laughs> uh, Jose, some of the barriers that you see on a regional or even uh, international level that you think are still impediments to the recovery. Yeah, uh, definitely we look obviously at large destinations like Cancun or Los Cabos, but we also need and address the, the need of having local circuits uh, of uh, tourism around communities. And uh, we need also to uh, increase the capacity of them in, in terms of adopting technology and adopting these safety protocols that these small communities, these uh, um, um, towns that we obviously would like to visit, would like to, to, uh, uh, to encourage their, their growth, need to be uh, uh, strengthened with. So there's a lot of work to be done in these small communities too. And if we're going to let people travel if they have vaccinations, we have to figure out what is that technology that allows them to safely upload it, Absolutely. actually get it, you know, communicate it to the proper authorities to be able to, to start this trip and this process. How about you, um, uh, you know, what impediments do you see? You must have applauded the EU decision yeah. uh, that is now going to allow vaccinated um, yes, you sure. know, people to travel. Yes, we did, we did. Um, there is a very high barrier stay, uh, at this moment, and it's pretty much uh, the following. Uh, World Health Organization identifies a set of activities of high risk, and one of them is still traveling. So all of us, you know, are saying that we have to articulate ourselves. Yes, we do. Governments have to articulate ourselves. But um, among us, we still have a huge barrier to overcome. And basically, it deals with the risk, the perception of the risk. And um, now, as you can imagine, in the pilot seat, is health, the, they are, the health authorities are in the pilot seat. And we have to have a clear message from uh, the World Health Organization saying, OK, Traveling um, does not bring any extra risk as long as you comply with the rules. And that's it. And we didn't get that message yet. So that's, that's something. When the day comes, I guess that the barrier will be removed for sure. Arnold, um, impediments to travel that you would love to see adapted, lifted? Yeah, building on what she said, it's, it's just uniformity mm -hmm. or consistency. Um, around the world. Um, you have today governments with health ministries, transportation departments, uh, tourism sectors, and they're not on the same page. And then across the countries, people aren't all on the same page. And that's what WTTC is trying to encourage. And that's, you know, the critical aspect of our private-public partnership. And, and that's what we need, um, science-based, uniform approach so people can travel safely in a frictionless way. Great. And Greg? 
much. I don't have much to add other than uh, uh, not uh, consistency is a, is a is a good point. If if governments who who have have constantly changed their policies have have inhibited demand and intent from people who want to travel. Uh, I think what we're looking for through the summer, through the back of the year, is certainty. W whatever the friction cost is of traveling, understand what that is, and then be able to either pay or not pay those friction costs, but allow certainty so the traveler can book, the traveler can plan, um, the companies can, can correspond with whatever demand they need to service that planning and that, and that travel. All of the surveys show that people want to start traveling again. They are so eager, they're chomping at the bit. But as you mentioned, it's feast or famine. If a resort or area is open, then it, they cannot keep up with the capacity. And I think a lot of people are uh, concerned about uh, returning to over-tourism. And we have a really good question because that's been a conversation point here at the conference. 2019 was the last year of what people described as over-tourism, too much pressure on um, uh, certain areas. So how do we avoid doing that as we come out of this crisis? This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, first of all, I think it starts when we were in Buenos Aires. I was on a panel on this. It's a very difficult subject in the first place. But I think it starts with self-determination. And I think one of the things that we've forgotten is when we talk about sustainability, we don't just talk about the environment. We talk about the preservation of natural cultural heritage and benefiting the local economies. So I think what you're going to see here is a lot of people, certainly at the affluent and experiential traveler, we have lots of data that this pandemic has made people rethink how they're going to travel. Um, and I do think that weaving those stories into it, and one of the things that we did in, in talking about sustainability, we, we doubled down on all of our efforts storytelling, data, et cetera. But one of the most important pieces is connecting sustainability to what was in that video. And Gloria, those, the videos you had today were some of the best I've ever seen WTTC do. Um, and I think what it gets to is reminding people that if you, we actually, in, in Florinopolis a long time ago at WTTC, somebody talked about what would happen if you had an imaginary switch to all the environmentalists that if you clicked it, everything would stop. Well, here we are. Yeah. Um, and it was proposed that it, it could actually be one of the greatest disasters in the history of the planet, ecologically and culturally and economically. So I think that coming back, focusing on the impact of travelers in the local economy, the preservation and things, those stories need to be told better. And I think that our sustainability stories need to be woven into the fabric of everything we say and everything we do, not as an appendix. It needs to be woven into the core of who we are and what we say, and we just have to become better storytellers. And we're going to really get deep into that conversation tomorrow um, because it really yeah. is about how we recover. Jose, we had another question um, um, that came in on the app about how do we uh, improve technology to be able to accelerate the recovery here in Mexico? Uh, uh, I think that I would like, it's not only in Mexico, it's everywhere. Uh, first, connectivity is something that needs to be uh, addressed very fast. And basically, we are, we are seeing a transition between the, the, all this connectivity that we have, the 5G networks uh, getting into connection with Wi-Fi 6, the capacity that we have to uh, take all this data and produce more and more intelligent offering a more savvy uh, uh, guest is coming also, and we need to anticipate a little bit uh, what is happening to them. Um, and also thinking that when we go online, someone puts us a cookie and follow us everywhere. So why, why are not taking this advantage when we get into Cancun and we follow all the traces and we find at what time we would like to wake up, which kind of breakfast I'd like to, to have, which kind of sport I, I, I'm willing more um, uh, have to uh, experience in my, in my um, time during, the, during the, the, the visit in the city. So there's a lot of things that needs to be uh, addressed within the industry and trying to have a more um, a connected experience with a more savvy uh, guest that is coming everywhere. Arnold, um, we have another question here. How difficult is this rehiring process going to be? Because people who are in marketing, people who are in technology, 
they have the capability of leaving travel and tourism and getting very good jobs in other sectors that are recovering faster. Um, in the service industry, people may be looking for what are those openings that maybe are not where they've been employed for the last decade. H how hard is the rehiring process going to be in, in, think, your, in your business, but also more broadly? Yeah, more broadly. I think, look, travel and tourism is still an exciting sector. And, and as we point out, the things that are open today, you can't service the demand. And so it's a, it has a tremendously bright future. We will learn to live with COVID-19. We'll learn how to manage it and live with it. And the future of travel and tourism is extremely bright. So um, I, I don't think it's going to be exceedingly difficult. There may be a period of time. You know, we've lost some good people who said, well, I don't know, we're going to start again. And so I've got to have this opportunity in another sector. Um, but when we're rolling again, um, we'll, we'll be able to attract the people that we need, as I feel. Greg, um, I just kind of want to um, wrap up our panel with really sort of uh, all of you being very thoughtful about what you wish you knew at the end of 2019 that maybe you now know, and what lessons really should be ingrained in our DNA to make sure that we're better prepared for the next big challenge that may be out there, what we've really learned from the COVID-19 crisis. Um. In, in, a, in an odd way, every one of the presentations I do to raise money, you have to identify risk. And I, I would do a presentation for a fund or a company, and I would identify the only thing that can stop this company, the only thing that can stop the march of the, this kind of growth is global pandemic flu. And each one of my investors said, it's never going to happen. Um, you know, the risk of that is, is minuscule. Um, Luckily, I'm glad I put that in my disclosure statements because it was less of an argument later on as to whether I'd adequately disclose what could happen. Uh, you know, I think I, I had been through the previous crisis. As some of you know, I was the chief investment officer at J.P. Morgan Chase during the financial crisis. And so the first move, as I said before, the first move for most, for most companies was to recognize the crisis and establish the amount of liquidity. That, that gave you the ability to make a lot of decisions. The companies that didn't do that suffered immeasurably during, during this time frame. So I knew that. I, I would say the thing I didn't know, um, and this is maybe more personal, is we've all had to learn to manage our businesses over Zoom, which is, which is a different thing, um, at least in our business, managing people, um, uh, allowing people to prosper. Also, what was interesting is our remote employees, for the first time, had an equal say to our employees who weren't remote. And I learned a lot of things about people who were based all over the world that I didn't, I didn't know before. Um, that was the biggest learning for me, and I'd like to be ready to manage more remotely going, going forward. Arnold, what, what uh, did you learn that you wish you knew before all of this that you would now ingrain in the DNA of how you manage your business? Uh, it's pretty funny how common it is, because I would always say when people say, what keeps you up at night? I would say, the only thing that keeps me up at night, you know, I would make some flip remark about a TV show or something, and I would say, but, you know, anything that makes people afraid to travel keeps people from traveling. And so one thing I've learned is I'm never going to say that again, <laughs> because obviously it happens. So I'm only saying positive things from now on. So um, the bottom line, though, is a similar thing, is we increased our communications tremendously because we're in a crisis. Uh, we raised $23.6 billion, which is a substantial sum for a company our size over the months, with nobody in an office. We weren't in an office, the banks weren't in an office, the investors weren't in an office, the lawyers weren't in an office. So we did it all virtually um, and, and kept the company alive with liquidity and whatnot. But the, but the um, amount of communication, the nature of communication has fundamentally changed uh, permanently going forward. And the other thing, the things that were reinforced, we went into this with a strong balance sheet. Thank goodness we did, okay? And so coming out of this, we will return to a strong balance sheet over time because it'll allow you to weather storms when they happen and, you know, the world is full of surprises. Yeah, Rita, what, what did you learn from this year that would help um, uh, protect what you do from future shocks in terms of stimulating tourism for Portugal? Um, several things but I would like I would like to highlight the communication part because you know we are dealing with um, the industry so all the economic operators then we have tourists and then we do have the residents and we do have to have a communication strategy to cover all these three uh, players 
and this is uh, something that should be easy to implement, but it's really not easy to, to, to execute. And so we, we did have a, a communication strategy, but I think we undermine a little bit, you know, the need to have a very assertive, clear, timing, timely, needed communication strategy. And so my feeling when I look back to, the, to, to what happened in 2020, I see a lot of noisy reactions and I think it really jeopardized the industry itself. In the long term, I think we will overcome this, but it creates this perception, it increases the perception of risk. And this is terrible in the industry, so we, we, we really need to, uh, to think about communicating better in a very assertive way, clear way. Um, in order to overcome this, this situation. Jose, communication and connectedness, it sounds like your sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, I think that we also need to make this communication more agile within, uh, to add up what, of what they were telling. Uh, to adopt agile in terms of leadership, uh, this uh, capacity to overcome in a timely manner to what's happening and to adapt fast is something that we just learned from this crisis. And there are going to be more crises to come, and we need to be very uh, well prepared. And uh, definitely, we need to be more uh, connected between each other because, from my perspective, we have a great risk in cybersecurity and cyber threats in the future. So, we need also to be prepared as industry on how to be reactive and be ready for those challenges that we are facing in an agile way. And, Matthew, you have the last word here. What you wish you'd known but what you now know that you would bake into your business's DNA to prevent from future shocks? I think, um, you know, one of the things that has really hit me was that major disruptions, and there's never been bigger than one, accelerate trends, either to the upside or the downside. Um, and, you know, our network is, is a co-created network. And so I think, for me, I think the biggest lesson was how do you take the concept of co-creation? You know, aggregation theory means that everybody who adds to a network actually adds value to that network. And I think we were headed in that direction because our membership and our partners are so diverse, but how do you actually build an ecosystem that allows that to self-perpetuate in a way that, quite frankly, you can get up in the morning and, and see things being done that you didn't even know were happening because they basically self-created themselves. So creating ecosystems, and those ecosystems actually become stronger with more connection. We talk about interoperability amongst, you know, health passes. We need to th strengthen interoperability amongst all ourselves, government, private sector, individual organizations. And this, this industry is absolutely right for being the leader of this because nobody has been affected like this, and no other industry is more an ecosystem that depends on each other like we are. And I think that's, that's my big takeaway. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for all of you for your great questions. Really a pleasure to be with you. So um, throughout this summit, we're going to have a number of flash learnings um, from leaders sharing their experiences, what they've learned that has helped 